Okay, we'll go ahead and get started here. I want to say good morning to everyone and thank you for joining us today for the Dark Skies premiere webinar. The webinar will be recorded for viewing later and the PowerPoint will also be shared with you all as well. My name is Sherry Bowman and I am from the Pueblo of Laguna and currently serve as the Education Support Specialist for IANTA. IANTA's mission is to define, introduce, grow, and sustain American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian tourism that honors traditions and values. Next slide, Larry. For those of you that are not familiar with IANTA, IANTA provides technical assistance and training needed to keep our communities engaged in tourism, hospitality, facilitate conversations on the economic and cultural importance of a healthy hospitality industry. Highlight the importance of visiting authentic American Indian, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian destinations and generates awareness, interest and demand for these destinations to domestic and international travelers, the travel, trade and the media. With this distinctive cultural heritage, culinary and agritourism offerings available throughout America's indigenous lands, tourism provides strong economic benefits for these communities. One of the greatest tools for our outreach and promotion of tribal tourism is our destination website, nativeamerica.travel. If you are not listed on the website, please contact us so then we can so we can help you get your listing live on the website. I ask that you please put your questions in the chat or the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Next slide, Larry. At this time, I would like to introduce you to our speaker, Larry Burton, who is IANTA's BLM program coordinator. Larry is also a Carson City-based photographer and has worked with Nevada's tourism industry for more than 12 years. He started his business, Outdoor Adventures, in 2008 and has worked for Nevada's Indian Territory, Elko Convention and Visitors Authority, Lander County Tourism, and numerous tribal entities photographing events, landscapes, and wildlife. His photos have been published in Nevada Magazine, Wells Roll Light, Abudone Magazine, and Ducks Unlimited. Larry has been certified by the Nevada Arts Council to teach photography and has been teaching workshops throughout the state for the past several years, specializing in outreach and increasing opportunities for small rural communities. So with that, I will turn it over to Larry and let him take it from here. And please um, put some questions in there if you're interested in um, anything you want to ask him. And thank you. Go ahead, Larry. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, it's a great invitation. I appreciate everybody showing up this morning. This is a little bit of an unusual Dark Skies presentation. Uh, a couple of things I like to get clear right off the bat is I started taking pictures back in the 80s. I've been around photography for a long time. Uh, th that doesn't mean necessarily I'm the best at it, but it does mean I've seen a lot of changes. And so what I'm going to present to you today, when I first started, it was all film photography. And I was one of those film guys when digital came along and never thought I would switch to that medium. But uh, obviously, we have all been forced to do that. And it's been a good change. Uh, one of the reasons it's been a good change is uh, star photography, dark sky photography. If it weren't for digital photography, we would not be able to photograph the stars. The film that I learned to shoot on, the ISOs were so low on it, and the sensitivity of the film was so low, we never dreamed we would be able to do what we're able to do today. So I'm anxious to share some of this with you. Having converted from film to digital, there are lessons that I learned that I hope to pass on to you. Everything I tell you today doesn't mean that it's written in stone. I took a Nikon representative out for a half day tour a few years ago. And we were talking about the latest Nikon digital camera that had over a million adjustments on it. He did not shoot that camera. He was using an older, simpler model. And uh, one of the things we talked about was besides being complicated, that million ways to take a photograph was exactly that. What I share with you, there are more than one way to do this. My knowledge of this today and what I'm going to share with you is hopefully tidbits that work for me, but please be aware you need to find out what works best for you. 
That's a, a big emphasis in everything I teach. One of the things we do talk about today, everybody's going to ask why they're learning to take photography or to photograph stars if they're teaching uh, webinars or if they're conducting workshops is uh, what I found in my experience, I started guiding photographers back in the 80s and I didn't know much about photography. So I was guiding people more experienced than myself. When I started my business in 2009, I figured to do the same, take people out and show them how to take pictures. Didn't really work out that way. It turns out that when people take it, or they're hoping the tour guide has something to pass on to them Frequently in today's world, a lot of people buy cameras that are a little bit over their head, and so they want some guidance. That's particularly true in the night sky workshops that I've been teaching for the last five years. 75% of my students come into the class wanting to know how to photograph stars. So it's essential if you're going to conduct nighttime sky tours, dark sky tours, you need to know at least the basic of what, basics of what's going on to, to set up your, uh, your tour. You also are going to be helping people get started. This presentation is the one that I use teaching these dark sky workshops. And uh, usually how I put it together is I do a two hour class in the daylight in a classroom setting or a convention center or in the camera store that I work with. We take two hours, go through what I'm going to show you. And then we adjourn for dinner and we go out to the field before dark to a chosen location set up our cameras and tripods and start shooting. We'll go into that in the second half of the program. So that's kind of what we're about today. If you find a couple of tidbits that you can use, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Please let me know. And if you have questions, as Sherry said, uh, please put them in the chat. We'll try and get to them. I have 45 slides to go over. Sometimes I get a little long-winded. I'm going to try and stay short of that today. But uh, in, in the time we have remaining, that's, uh, it's going to be pretty busy. So put your questions in there. And if we don't have time for all the questions, my contact information has been listed. This is my personal email for my business, but I also have an AANTA account, uh, lburton at aanta.org. And I'm happy to answer questions, anybody, anytime, email, text, or phone on what we're about to discuss today. So with that, we'll get started. One of the reasons we talk about what a photograph is, it's a very basic thing, but most people tend to think of a photograph as a picture of an object. That is not the case. A picture is created by light falling on a photosensitive surface, usually photographic film or an electronic image sensor. As I mentioned earlier, the electronic sensors are much more sensitive than the film was. So most photographs are created using a camera, which uses a lens to focus the scene's visible wavelengths of light into a reproduction of what the human eye could see. Uh, this was early 1800s. They were experimenting with photographs. Uh, in 1839, the word photograph was coined by Sir John Hirsch and is based on the Greek word phos, meaning light, and graph, meaning drawing, writing, together, meaning light. This is very important when you're photographing the stars because you're not photographing a statue or a photograph or a landscape. You're actually photographing the light being broadcast from the stars, the Milky Way, the moon, or whatever celestial body you're looking at. There are three stages necessary to create a photograph. One of the reasons we talk about this, I mentioned this earlier in a chat with Sherry and Bianca, you need to collect the image using a digital or film camera. Then you need to process that image. In the old days, we used a dark room. Nowadays, we use a computer. I tend to think of my computer as a digital dark room. It's essential shooting night skies that you learn enough about processing these images to bring them to life. And we'll talk about that more as we get into the presentation. The third is to print the image. What you see on this screen doesn't look the same when you print it on paper. It's that way with any photograph and it has been that way since the beginning of time. Another advantage of the modern era is we have our laptops or our computers to develop the images and a printer can be accessed for two, $300. You can get a Canon printer 
that will print your images. So you get to actually make them look like you act what you saw when you were making the image. These are some of the cameras that I use. The center camera, this camera presentation is put together for several classes. It's a Olympus Tough, it's a waterproof camera. It doesn't do well with stars. The sensors aren't set up for that. It doesn't have enough good manual settings. The camera on the left is a Canon 70D. It's out of date now. I'm using a 90D, which is also out of date. They're classified as DSLRs. They have a mirror in there. They're like the old 35 millimeter cameras where you look through the lens, actually look through the lens. Camera on the right is classed as a hybrid. This one is a Nikon P600. It's upgraded all the way to a P1000 now. They do have enough manual settings on them. You can shoot the stars, but they're not ideal cameras. They do not have interchangeable lenses on them, but they are. you can work with them for a little less money than you spend on a DSLR or a mirrorless equivalent. These are the cameras I use today. The one on, the, on your right is the Canon 90D. You can see that. It has a wide angle a Sigma lens on it right there. Wide angle is great for shooting the stars. You want the full sky. The little Olympus on the left is uh, a mirrorless camera. Most of the manufacturers nowadays are going to mirrorless cameras. Canon does not even make a DSLR anymore. It's all mirrorless. One of the advantages of the, of the mirrorless cameras is there's no movement. My camera, when you snap a picture that mirror has to flip up out of the way so you can see through the lens. When you shoot the stars, you have to lock that mirror up. So you are actually looking through the lens, but you don't have that mirror interference in, in movement. So uh, there are a lot of advantages to the mirrorless cameras. One of the things you need to be aware of when you pick a way to start taking pictures, none of the lenses are interchangeable. The DSLR lenses will not work on a mirrorless camera and vice versa. So you need to put a little bit of thought into what you're going to use. I would recommend strongly you talk to somebody that takes photographs, get acquainted with them. Don't just listen to the people in the camera store and don't try and buy everything off of Amazon. You do need to talk to some experienced photographer before you start picking a medium and a way to take the pictures that you want to take. This is my favorite camera ever. It's the 90D, like I said, got Sigma lens on it. One of the things I will tell you about shooting the stars, I was reluctant to start shooting stars because they didn't have the equipment. The sensors in the camera I had in that, at that time were not strong enough and the lenses that I had were not good enough. Sigma used to be a poor name in lenses, but in the last 15, 20 years, they have major upgraded their stock and they're some of the best lenses on the market, but you still can spend $1,000 on a lens to shoot stars. This lens is not that expensive. The one that I do shoot most of the stars with is considered an artist lens and it is $1,000. It'll cost you as much as a camera body or more. If you buy Nikon, Canon lenses, or Zeiss lenses, you can spend anywhere up to $6,000 for a lens. You don't need to go that high. You don't need to spend that kind of money, but uh, you can usually get a setup like this one you see here for under $2,000. Camera body's about a grand, and the lens, a good lens, is about the same. So it's worth, like I say, it's worth thinking about. This little compact mirrorless here, it's got a very small sensor. It's called a half crop sensor. It's not as big as a 35 millimeter film used to be, but uh, they're getting more and more popular because they are compact. They do take excellent images and uh, it's, it's a, a way to go if you're gonna do a lot of travel. And that's why I purchased this model was because I was trying to get in and out of airplanes easily. One thing you do need if you're gonna shoot star shots is a tripod. You cannot handheld those photos. You're taking at 20 second or longer exposure sometimes. So you need to get a good tripod. You'll notice the head on this one, it's called a ball head. It's not like the ones you buy down at Walmart that got the big levers on them and the fluid heads for you shooting video. You want something smaller and more compact so you can, again, travel with it, get close to it and make your adjustments, but it has to be strong enough to hold your equipment steady through long exposures. Don't shortcut yourself on a tripod and a, and a ball head. This is a DSLR. This is a view screen activated. Gives you all the settings on the camera. 
one of the things you need to learn when you shoot night sky photographs is you need how to run, learn to run everything on your camera manually. It's not as complicated as you think, especially with these view screens. This is the view screen on what's called live view with the mirror locked up. This isn't actually looking through the lens. This is a digital reproduction of what the lens sees with that mirror locked up. That's how you will shoot the stars. The bottom of this photograph, you'll see a light meter down there. That light meter is critical to what you do when you shoot star shots. There are three keys to controlling the light coming into your camera. The first thing and the most critical is ISO. We'll talk about each of these as we come to them. Basically, ISO is the camera sensor sensitivity to light or the film sensitivity to light. F-stop is the opening. You see pictures look like an eye opening and closing. Uh, that's what you use for stars. You want that as wide open as it will go to gather as much light as possible. 2.8 is pretty common. The more expensive lenses that you buy have larger openings on them. That's why they're more expensive. Shutter speed is the final one. You want to stop motion and do things like that. Shutter speed is critical. Uh, it is balanced between the f-stop and the amount of light coming in and how fast that shutter opens and closes. One of the things you need to learn, and this is one of the big things that people have issues with with cameras, the sensors in the computers in the cameras are calibrated from the factory to make the exposures as even as possible. They want to make them look very average, very bland. You want to overcome that to create an image more like this. You do that. I learned this shooting film. I was told when I switched to digital, you didn't have to do this like you did with film, that you could let the computer fix it all post-process. But my experience, that was not true. I still underexpose with a digital camera similar to what I did when I was shooting film. This is the result. There's not a whole lot of editing on this image, and I find it much more pleasant than this one. You're going to notice the same thing on the stars. When you shoot the stars, you'll have an image pop up on the back of your camera, which leads us to one of the other advantages of shooting digital images. When I shot images, when I first started out, you had to send them off to get them developed, or you had to do them your own self in a dark room. Sometimes it was weeks before you saw what your images were. In today's world, you get immediate gratification. You get to see exactly what that image is, and if your exposure isn't right, it really shortens the learning curve because you can make an adjustment right on site, take another image immediately, and, and, and save the trip out. We're going to talk about ISO quickly. Uh, ISO is established by the International Organization for Standardization, derived from the Greek isos, meaning equal. What in the world that has to do with any of this? I don't know, but that's where it came from. The important thing to remember here is star trails are introduced into Milky Way photography if we use shutter speed values above 25 to 30 seconds. To compensate, you use a high ISO. Some of the images that you see were prepared for this class and I have written down the settings for those and you'll see what the ISO settings were and some of the uh, images that result from it. This is the best explanation I can come up with for ISO, when I was shooting film, if you shot ISO 200 film, it was considered a big deal. 400 was considered too grainy to use. A, uh, Fuji came out with an ISO 800 and professionals wouldn't use it. Today, we shoot ISO values with digital cameras all the way up to 25,600 and above. The little dots that they rep see represented in that bottom right-hand photo, that's what happens the higher the ISO goes up, the, they call it noise, the more noise you get in the image. My Canon, I can set it when I use high ISO settings, and I typically use 1600 and 3200 to shoot stars. The computer automatically goes through, it takes a blank image, then it takes my star image, compares the two, and it'll automatically take out the ISO, I mean the, the, the noise, if you will. If you shoot raw images, 
which we'll talk about that in a bit. You can take those out as well during the post process. You're editing your images. This is F stops represented. F22, the one on the left, is the smallest. F14 is a very wide open, fast lens. Those are the ones you pay the big money for. They're very, very helpful when you shoot star shots. This will give you an idea of the different f stops. This uh, lupin patch was shot at f29. You can see the details in the flower, sharp edge to edge, all the way to log. f4.5, it reduces that depth of field. So you only see a picture in the center that's clear. Everything else is out of focus. You get around that on the stars. You'll see some things on the internet about shoot small f-stops to make them sharper, but most cameras and most good lenses, when you focus them to infinity, then they are sharper edge to edge. You don't have the problem there that you do this. So that's one of the reasons you can get away with shooting wide f-stops when you shoot star shots. Shutter speed's pretty simple. This shows how fast it is on the camera for this. This chart lays it out pretty well. Single star points, you want sharp stars, 21 to 30 seconds max. If you want to shoot star trails, you see those pictures with the little trails going in them, you'll uh, want to go 10 minutes or longer. Those are the key things to remember here. One thing they don't talk about there is white balance. I shoot JPEG images mostly. They're compressed a little bit. You can't do as much with those post-process as you can with raw images but the file sizes are smaller. I do a lot of commercial work. Most, well, all of my commercial customers want JPEG images because they're not as big as raw images. I know a lot of serious star photographers will only shoot in raw because they can go back in post-process and layer images and do more with them. Uh, that's one of the things that intimidated me when I first started. Didn't even realize you could shoot good JPEG images. You'll get a chance to evaluate that yourself when you see what we have following. But one thing you need to be aware of, white balance is critical no matter what you're photographing. And if you're shooting JPEG images, you can adjust it in the camera as you take the images. This is adjusted for a cloudy day to take some of the blue out, give it natural tones. This is Mount Whitney shot at sunrise where the standard daylight color balance. This is called the sweet light, best light, whatever you want to call it. It's obviously sunrise. It has a warm cast to it. That's a natural thing that you see in the, in the, in the landscapes that you shoot at sunrise and sunset. That's the prime time for most guys to want to take pictures. 20 minutes later, this is shot from the same location with the same settings. You can see how it changes the light makes things different. Neither is a bad photo. They're both good in their own way. When you shoot the stars, we'll talk about that. We're going to show you that next. This is a Milky Way shot up in the Sierras. This is with the color balance set on cloudy. It warms the Milky Way up. I like this warmer feel. A lot of people do not. They want to set theirs for daylights or they set a K factor over 7,000. The reason for that is they like this blue. I don't know how much time you spent looking at the Milky Way and the stars, but you don't see a whole lot of color always. The stuff you see from uh, NASA and all that has been computer enhanced. It's kind of up to you. This is where the post-processing comes in and where the taking the images comes in. You get to make it look like what you want to make it look like. The 500 rule in photography, this is for full frame cameras. That's the big rage right now. Uh, Nikon just came out with a new one two years ago that's still pretty current. 500 rule for a full frame camera requires you to set your camera to ISO 3200 or 6400, aperture to f2.8, which is very common, and your shutter speed to 500 divided by the focal length of your camera. So if you're shooting a 50 millimeter lens, which is again, pretty standard for a lot of cameras. Shutter speed would be 10 seconds. If you have a crop sensor, which is what I shoot, uh, D90 or 90D is a crop sensor. It's about three quarters the size of a full frame. This changes. I do not know the mathematical percentage to make it work out. A lot of people do. But again, I see my images on the back. 
So I have this as a starting point, and then I go from there until I get the image that I wanna see. This is a Milky Way shot at Lake Tahoe, taken in 2019, f-stop 1.8, exposure was 10 seconds. This is with that art lens that I told you about. The ISO was only 1600, so there shouldn't have been much noise, but you can see there's a little. The white balance was set on auto, and I warmed it up a little post-process. That yellow horizon you see there, is light pollution coming from Sacramento, California, 150 miles away from Lake Tahoe. Or 100 miles, maybe it's only 100. Anyway, that's how far the light pollution can go and the effect it can have on your images. If you shoot raw, you can take that out. I prefer, this is what I actually saw. The sensor actually picked up a little more yellow than I was seeing with my eyes. Still not a bad image but it's not exactly what you envision when you do a star image. This is closer to what you want to see when you do a star image. This was shot at f3.5 using that wide angle lens. This was the 20 second exposure. You can see the stars are still pretty sharp. I like the color balance here. I like the feel of this photograph. I like the big trees. They add something to this photo in my opinion. You want something to frame your photo. One of the things we're not going to talk about a lot today is composition. But that's one of the things that people request continually in my classes. Even with the stars, you want to do something you can to frame the photo, give it some definition, make it look good. I'm also told you can kind of see it here if you look. My mouse in here. This is the horse. I was always told a good Milky Way image, this horse is going up. But you can see the legs and the back, front legs and the head of this horse. So that's one of the things you want to look for. When you're doing your star shots. This is a different color balance, a little warmer than the other one. Kind of a sample of some of the things that you can do. This is a 15 second exposure at ISO 6400. So you can see the noise isn't too awful bad here. You still got good star points. You can see the planet on the left and the Milky Way fairly clearly. Hear me talk about post-process, Photoscape, Photoshop, Lightroom, to some people, those are bad words, but in all honesty, every camera you shoot has some kind of processing, microprocessor processing going on to make the images you want. I'm not a big Lightroom or Photoshop guy. I don't know that I'm not technically good enough to do a lot of those. They're great programs and people that use them, I highly support them. They love raw images because then they can layer them. Photoscape is a little simpler than that. Photoscape X Pro, Microsoft, and a lot of those guys now are charging, and Photo and Adobe's charging monthly fees. Photoscape, you can still edit your pictures. This is an actual screenshot from my computer. You recognize the image. I was working it up for this program. This program costs $40, and there's no monthly fees. It will do edits. It will not layer, but it will do exposure. You can take out a clone stamp to take out a jet trail or a beer can somebody left where they shouldn't have. So there are things you can do with it, but it doesn't have the flexibility some of the other program. I teach this when I do the nice guy classes. In the last class I taught, four of the 12 participants went back to their hotel room on a dinner break, bought this program. They were so excited when they got it. They came back for the shoot that night, said it was worth it cost of the class just to learn to get this program. So I highly recommend it. Be careful when you buy it. You buy anything online. Microsoft has gotten wind that people are using this and they're selling a version of it and they want their $10 a month. So be aware of that as you do this, but let the buyer beware. One of the reasons you need to post-process your star images, you're going to notice this immediately. You're going to get out there and you're going to take these beautiful shots and a little tiny screen on the back of your camera. You're going to think they're perfect. This is so cool. And then you're going to go download on your computer the next day what you shot. And this is what you're going to see, sometimes even darker. And you're going to, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. It gets back to what I mentioned about the digital screens. Every screen sees things differently and that little compact screen, just like on your phone, makes things look better than they are sometimes. 
So you need to lighten these pictures up to get this. This is what it looked like on the computer. This is what it looked like on the back of the camera when I took it. And it's a simple matter of lightening it up, increasing the contrast. There's two or three little adjustments. You can see the horse, you can see the light contamination. This is Lake Tahoe, South Shore Lake Tahoe. We were camped out up there. I still like the pictures, even with the light contamination, I still like the pictures. I still like to go out and mess with it. It adds a dimension. It's not perfect for a dark sky, but I try and find those as well. This is another image from the same location shot looking north instead of south. Again, got it home, put it on the computer and thought, wow, lightened it up. And the whole reason I shot this one was because of that tree with a fork in the middle. A little bit of light contamination still coming in from Sacramento, but still not a bad, not a bad star night sky. Now we're gonna switch and talk a little bit about workshops. There are mechanics involved in teaching a workshop. One of the big ones is we let 12 was one. You know, we let 12 students in this class. I usually restrict my night classes to 10 or 12 people. The reason for that is simple. You get too many people out there, they're tripping over each other, they're interfering with each other's shots, and it's especially critical at night to give everybody a little bit of space and be able to work with each person individually. So this class was done in Tonopah in 2019. There's a mining park in Tonopah. This is also critical to doing workshops. There are only about five, six nights a month that you can shoot Milky Way images and they're normally best between May and October. In the wintertime, the Milky Way doesn't hardly rise above the horizon. In February, I have shot Milky Way photos, but you got to do it at four in the morning. The Milky Way changes as it crosses the horizon and it comes up earlier each night. We did this one in September. The Milky Way usually pops up, I want to say, around 10 o'clock, 9 30, 10 o'clock. So you can do things, but you need to do something with the people in the meantime. The other thing that happens is invariably you schedule a class, get everybody set up coming in. This class, we have people come from Tonopah. Tonopah only has 2,100 people living in it. They started this night sky. They're the ones that pushed me really hard to do these nighttime classes. They wanted to get into the night sky routine. They are along Highway 6. There is a starriest sky route from Death Valley to Great Basin National Park, they are on that route. They wanted to take advantage of that and get some tourism going there. So they asked me to do this. But what happens, we get people from Ely, we get people from California, Colorado, we get people from all over the country, this class. And one of the things that makes me think it works well for us is we get a lot of repeat customers. Probably 30, 40% of my customers here are repeat people. They come back, they have such a good time, they wanna do it again. But we have had smoke from the fires in California. We had thunderstorms move in one year. So you have to have some pipe people to make it feel like it's worth their effort to come in. This mining park is perfect. They let us come in at night. There's not a lot of light pollution there. We can do light painting. We can get stars if they're available. If not, then we get ghosts walking through buildings. We do all kinds of other things that we'll show you. So that's one of the Important components, if you're going to do night sky workshops, you have to have a backup in case the weather doesn't cooperate. This photograph is sunset that same day. See all those stars? I mean, all those clouds and jet tails? Not many stars that night. Our success that night came from the lightning storms that came in an hour later. Everybody got lightning flashes, and that year we didn't get stars. But everybody, I like to say, 40% of the people came back the following year looking for the stars again. And they had so much fun, we just didn't worry about it. You take what you get. This is the last class I taught in Tonopah. We got smoked out. You can see some stars in the upper left-hand corner of this, but it was really hard to get good Milky Way photos. So I took some tea lights that you buy in the dollar store and I put four of them in this cave. Gave it a real prehistoric look. You had to climb a pretty bad slope to get up to that, but it'd been nice to get some shadows of people standing around the fire. There's all kinds of opportunity here for things. 
I actually had students borrow my lights from me when I left town. They stayed in town for an extra two or three days to keep photographing this stuff. There's an interest in this. You just need to provide something interesting to keep people occupied in addition to the stars because the stars are your main goal, but you're not always able to achieve that. So be prepared for that. This is another option. This is one of my favorite dark sky locations down by Markleyville in the Sierras. The reason the Milky Way is so far to the right, when we started working the class that night, it was over on the left by the trees. I don't normally take images when I have a class, maybe one or two to set an example for everybody, but then I work with the other students. This night I let it go, but I had set this tent up and I lit it again with those tea lights, trying to create a little different feel for things. By the time it was my turn to take pictures and everybody was leaving, the Milky Way had moved that far across the sky. But still an interesting photo. There are so many possibilities when you do night sky stuff. This is a concept that came up. Ben Rupert, one of the guys I run around with, he's a tribal member, Washoe tribal member here in the Carson area. And uh, he is an eagle dancer. So he wanted to see what it would look like if he was dressed in his regalia and we got the Milky Way in the background. This was shot up on Monitor Pass, uh, just east of Markleyville, about seven, 8,000 foot elevation, and pretty creative way to put an image together. It's one of my favorites that I've done in the last couple of years. You're gonna run into light painting. Everybody wants to do it. It's a big way, a Burning Man festival that is held in the Black Rock Desert, east of Reno every year. They do a lot of light painting with fireworks and things. And, you're gonna have students wanna do it. It is difficult to combine a light painting class with the dark sky class. Uh, you need to separate them and have them on separate nights. This was painted with a little keychain light to show his regalia at night. It's very, very hard to match the light to the other exposure, the nighttime exposure. So you'll end up taking five or six or eight of these to get one to turn out. This is another light painting effort. This is Ben again. This, uh, his regalia here is a bear. That's one of his dances. He does a bear dance. This is Kay Rock on the east shore of Lake Tahoe. There was so much snow this night, we couldn't get around the lake to get to the Milky Way locations we needed to. So we ended up falling back on this. It goes to show you, you don't always have to be for the Milky Way. You can see a few skies in the, I mean, a few clouds in the sky, still get some good stars in the cave. You can see cave rock and some of the stuff going on and being posed under it. And again, it took uh, probably 10 or 12 tries before we got the exposure we wanted here. But it's something fun to do at night, make some very creative images. This is a Neowise Comet. This is taken at Incline in the North Shore of Lake Tahoe. Neowise was a big deal back in 2020. I needed to take these images. It took me three nights before I actually got what I wanted. I read everything I could, listened to the experts and everybody recommended telephoto lens. I ended up shooting this with 18 millimeter lens, 10 second exposure, ISO 2500. And to be honest with you, I could not see that comet with the naked eye. That was why everybody said telephotos. You needed binoculars to see the comet. How I found the comet was to point my camera at the sky and snap images until I was finally able to catch uh, just in a corner of my frame that comet. And then I was able to adjust the camera on the tripod and come up with that. The sky wasn't quite as dark when the comet was out there. It made it look a little darker in the sensors, but I left it that way. It shows the comet real well. Just some of the things you can play with, but you need to do it yourself. You need to figure out what works for you. This is one of my favorite all-time nighttime photographs. This is down at Stewart Indian School, South Carson. Stewart operated there from 1890 to 1980. It has stone buildings, beautiful. It's still in existence. Uh, it's not an Indian school anymore. It's a home to the Nevada Indian Commission. And they do a lot of law enforcement training down there and fire training down there. So the buildings, a good portion of the buildings are still in use. Uh, this was shot one night after a powwow. You see the full moon coming up on the right. 
this always intrigued me, this water tower lit at night. So it's not like a star shot. The exposures are not as long. I shot this at F5, one third of a second. ISO is only 400. This, one of the reasons I include this in here, besides the fact that it's from Stuart, is that you want to have something extra for everybody to do, like I said. And uh, there are so many options available for you in that area. Okay, one of the last things I do for everybody at my workshops is I include a night shooting checklist. Everybody that attends one of my sessions gets this. There are nine items listed here. You need a full battery pack. You need your camera set on full manual. You need lens focusing on manual. That's one of the hardest things and one of the things we didn't talk about a lot, but if you buy kit lenses and you buy the less expensive, you go to Walmart or Kmart, and you buy a $1,200 Canon lens, uh, camera with three lenses, those inexpensive lenses, you can run them on manual, but it's difficult to focus them with the stars. The more expensive lenses have hash marks and settings on them so that you can set them on uh, unlimited and make them focus on manual. With uh, the kit lenses, you have to actually focus a flashlight on something way in the distance and focus the thing and then it's a lot more complicated than it is with the more expensive lenses, but you want to run your focus on manual. You want to turn off your focus stabilization. Most cameras nowadays have an anti-vibration thing in them, cell phones in particular. Uh, you need to turn that off. You can run your white balance on auto or whatever you choose. You can uh, turn on long exposure noise reduction if your camera has it. There's also a high ISO speed noise reduction. You need to turn that on. You need a tripod and a small pin light. A lot of people recommend red lights only because you lose your night vision. That's nice to have, and I have some, but any small pin light like you get on a keychain works really good just to see the controls on your camera. Lens cap off. One of the things about running your camera on manual, you can take a thousand pictures of your lens cap. I know a guy learned this the hard way drove an hour over a really rough dirt road to get into a waterfall, set up a couple of additional uh, lenses to, so I mean lights to light up some trees, gonna photograph a big waterfall in the Sierra, took six images at midnight, they were all black. Figured something was wrong with the camera, loaded everything back in the truck, got almost all the way out, saw a picture at a local lake, stopped and one more try, and realized the lens cap was on. This guy teaches classes and is supposed to know what he's talking about. So he learned the lesson the hard way. Take your lens cap off. That's why that reminder is on there. And anytime you get to thinking you're hot stuff and know you're cool, you, uh, I look at this and remember that mess up. This is Lake Tahoe in the star, uh, in the sunset in the evening. So that'll get us to questions and answers. Let's go to the chat and see what we got. Come on. Where is this? Sherry, you're on mute. Oh, I'm on mute. How did that happen? I'm on mute. <laughs> I was saying thank you, Larry. There aren't any um, questions in the uh, chat. There are a few comments. Um, one from Gina Pearson. Um, she says, awesome pics, Larry, to learn more about light pollution and ways to might mitigate C. And then she put in a website. So that's good. Cool. And then, of course, Ben says it was an awesome presentation. So if there are not any more questions, we can go ahead and end this webinar. Um, again, the uh, video One will be... really quick, Sherry, about light pollution. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we are working with... Uh, Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative to try and discuss light pollution. This presentation is geared to get people excited about the night sky. One of the things we have in rural Nevada, we've got a 400 mile long road, Highway 50, that travels 90% of its dark sky stuff. The communities along there are small. A lot of them have less than 100 residents. We would like to get them excited about this dark sky initiative, and we're hoping to get them knowing that they can get involved with this stuff 
and that will give them some incentive to protect those night skies. So that's one of the directions we're working at Ayanta. We want to help get some economic opportunity for these guys and at the same time make them aware of what is available for them. So that's some of this stuff uh, that uh, these contacts that are given here and all of this information, take a look at it online and, and understand you don't have to start with a complicated package to shoot night skies. But once you get there, it might be enough incentive to get people to, to participate in this Dark Skies initiative. Great Basin National Park is, is registered as a dark sky location and uh, it's on the eastern side of the state. And it's part of that connection between uh, the starriest route that's listed in this uh, list of uh, contact information. And it goes from Death Valley to Great Basin National Highway 50 runs right by that, that park. So it, it's good reference for places to look to do night skies. It's easy to find. And uh, we would encourage everybody to go out and take a look at it and, and see what you can come up with. Anything else you want to add, Larry? I think that's about it. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us today. I do want to um, remind you to save the date for our 25th annual American Indian Tourism Conference taking place at the Choctaw Casino and Resort Durant. And that will be held October 2nd through the 5th of 2023. And we should be opening registration very, very soon. So with that, um, please visit ianta.org to learn more about our education program offerings. And you can do that at ianta.org. Again, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it and we'll see you next time. Thank you.